So welcome everyone. My name is Lisa Presley. I'm one of the Congregational Life Consultants for the Mid-America region. I'm uh, glad to see you here today as we cover the topic of how to do congregational meetings on Zoom. We are recording this webinar, so just wanted to let you know that. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Andrew Zoller, who is helping get you into the meetings and, um, and doing that kind of thing. Because of the number of people who are registered for this meeting, I'm not going to allow you to unmute yourself. I am going to instead um, invite you to put questions that you have into the uh, chat box and I will be monitoring that. There's also a dedicated time for questions and answers at the end, so I'll make sure that we can uh, do that. But this is um, this webinar is based on what I learned and had to learn while we were hosting our regional assembly just a few weeks ago. I don't know if many of you were there, but it, uh, and then also I've just been doing some more exploring since then to figure out other alternative ways of making sure that you can have your congregational meetings. Um, and and your you know one of the things that people say is your mileage may vary. This is just one approach. You can easily have different things that are are uh, going on in your lives or you know in your congregations that make these not the answers for you. So that's the that's the great part about all of this is that it's very adaptable. Um, and uh, so with that, I'm just going to start launching off. Um, oh. If you don't know how to find the chat, if you go along the bottom of your Zoom bar, um, you might have to move a cursor or something. This is if you're on a computer. You can click on the three dots for the more, and that will allow you to bring up the chat um, if it's not already up on your bottom bar. And um, if you cannot see the whole slide, at the top of your screen, there will be something that says you are sharing Presley 2's screen with the button that says View Options. And you can click on that. If you do side by side, you will see the, um, still see my face along the edge, I'm sorry, but uh, you can then see the entire screen without any part of it being covered up. All right, so let's go. Um, Okay, now I got to get this computer to, there we go. So one of the things just really to pay attention to is the fact that we are in unusual times, in case you hadn't figured that out yet. Uh, things are not going to be the same as they already, always were. Nothing is going to be the way it should be. And so this actually gives you a lot of freedom to be able to invent a new way and just remind people, this is going to be different. We can't do things the way we always have. And and so that, um, that is a, a great blessing to free yourself from the expectation that you will have to be perfect in this endeavor. Everything that I'm talking about in this webinar will need to be adapted to your situation. And part of that depends on what is the culture. How, uh, how do people expect things to happen in your congregation? And what might be some wrinkles that make this different for you? It also depends on the trust level. We were really blessed in our regional assembly that people trusted us to do things well. And when we had votes, um, we were assuming that only those people who were delegates and were enabled to vote, voted because we only had about um, between a third and a half of the people who were on who actually cast ballots. And so we had trusted them to vote if they were, um, and I'll be getting more into that later. But so it depends on the trust. There's also legal considerations, and you might be well served to be able to uh, reach out to a lawyer in your community to find out, you know, what is, what restrictions might there be on the, on the, um, on the holding of meetings virtually in your state? How can you work around them? And also, what is it that your bylaws say themselves? And just to let you know, I will be sending out these slides after the meeting. I was tinkering on them up until like three minutes before we let you in. So I will be sending those out as well as a couple other documents. And the last slide has link uh, to some information on the UUA website about the whole matter of legality. And we'll be getting into that a little bit further on in this presentation. 
The other thing to remember, this will not be perfect. You will not be perfect, but you will have done perfect work in getting your congregation together to be able to do this. Just keep on remembering this is not business as usual. We don't have to have that same slick feel we might have when we're doing this uh, in person. You will make mistakes. Uh, if you were at our regional assembly, you will see it sometimes took us two or three times to get something to technologically go along with what we wanted it to do. I still yearn for the computer system that will do what I want rather than what I will tell it, but um, that date hasn't come here yet. And so part of what you just really do is to just breathe take a break know that you will um that things will go weird and you can just say to folks on your meeting hey we're going to need a couple minutes here just to figure this out so stay tuned um you know we'll we're not abandoning you um the other thing and i'll talk more about what this team should look like is that don't try to do any of this alone there are just so many things that are going on. For example, it's great to have Andrew here who can let people in while I'm talking rather than distracting and, you know, I have to do that kind of thing. And so it's just wonderful to have that. And uh, for our regional assembly, we actually had a team of about seven or eight people who are doing all the magic behind the scenes. You might not need that many, but you might. Um, you also need to remember that everything you're doing is going to take longer. It's going to take longer for people to type in their questions if you're doing questions that way. It's going to take longer to take the votes and all of that. And you need to simply do that. You can practice an abundance of time and space and so that you can just relax in that. Um, we also were very well served at our regional assembly by creating a covenant around the meeting about what kind of behavior would be acceptable and what kind of behavior would not be. Um, you will note in this meeting that I only have you able to chat to me or the other co-hosts and um, and so uh, you might want to, you will need to choose on that and I talk about that later. But um, we talked about that. We also had very explicit comments about, you know, we need to be kind to each other. And we had an explicit warning that if people were to misbehave, they would be kicked out of the meeting and not let back in. So that's just to let you know the, um, you know, the, the kind of covenant we had, but creating a covenant or building on your own congregational covenant bef as the meeting begins will be really helpful for you all. So the team, who do you need as the team? Um, the, the, there are really uh, two or three different kinds of team or uh, functions that you're doing. One, you're trying to do the business part of the meeting. Um, and then you're also doing the technological part of the meeting. So with the business part, one of the things that we were really well served by is that we knew what motions we needed before we began. So that allowed us to create the polls that we needed before. It also allowed us the ability to find people who would be willing to move the motions and second the motions. So we didn't have to try to look out into the crowd of people and figure out on Zoom, figure out, oh, who's moving in this, who's seconding it. There's nothing illegal or improper about that. Um, this happens in a lot of meetings, even in person to do that. Um, you also need to figure out what is the business you really need to be doing. I strongly encourage you to delay the stuff that can be delayed, especially if it's a controversial topic. I know that one of our congregations um, was just about to vote on a change of the name of the congregation right as lockdown happened. And for some reason, they got the smart idea that this, you know, the name of a congregation, maybe not in your place, but in most I've been in, it's been so difficult when you want to think about changing that. And so they realized that that was a conversation they could postpone. I once was a president of a congregation that was just Don Heights Unitarian because they couldn't decide whether or not they were a church, a congregation, a society, a parish, or whatever. You don't want to have to have those kind of arguments while you're virtual with each other. It will not help at all. 
So then you also need on the team people who will be able to help with the technological part. You, if you're the one presiding at the meeting, the president or whatever, you don't have to be able to do everything. You just need to be able to get the people in a room together, a virtual room, to be able to have those conversations. So what is the technology you're going to be using and who is doing what parts? Uh, if you're using a waiting room, who's going to be admitting them? Who will be the one to launch the polls? Who will be the one to answer the monitor for questions uh, and other things like that? So so it's looking at who is helping with the various aspects of that. You also will have to have this team help you figure out how are you going to vote. We'll be getting more into how you can possibly vote later on, but that's going to be a big one. And, um, and you also need somebody who can help prepare the votes for you in advance, either whether you're using Zoom polling software or something else. Having all of that in place beforehand makes the meeting go well. You can, with most of those software, also add votes if you need them during the meeting, but that's going to allow people to take a stretch break because you're going to have to sit there and madly type uh, the host will to be able to get that information in. You also need a communication plan for how you're going to be in touch with each other as things are happening during the meeting. So say something goes a little bit awry. One of the things that we did, we were all on a group text. So we could either text each other individually if there was a question uh, we needed to monitor, you know, is this something everybody needs to know? But if we were seeing some kind of disruption, we could just say to, uh, you know, send one text and it said, hey, folks, we need to shut this down, or hey, folks, check out, you know, this person, they seem to be doing some interesting things that might be that they're a Zoom bomber. Um, and I'll talk about Zoom bombing in a bit. But you can also, there's GroupMe, there's Slack, there's all kinds of different ways. And But you want to figure that out before you get into the plan. And I do want to say that, that I didn't come up with all this stuff myself. This was a great uh, team endeavor to figure this out. Andrew was a part of the, uh, was heading up all the sort of technological and, um, and uh, aspects. And my colleague Sharon Dittmar was heading up all our programmatic aspects. Our technical director, Gretchen um, Oman, was also helping with all of that. And so they helped us think and frame about all this. So I'm I learn from other people and I'm just the one who gets to pass along that learning to you. So Zoom bombing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you probably have heard about Zoom bombing. This is when uh, people come into your meeting with the intention of being disruptive, often with, um, with racist, sexist, or pornographic imagery or that kind of thing. And so one of the things that we have learned to do is we have to be able to balance safety and security with having open meetings. How do we make sure that our people have access, but no one is subjected to Zoom bombing? We did have a couple of our staff who got Zoom bombed in a meeting and just had to, uh, it, uh, what often happens is people come in en masse, four or five at the same time, and they just start um, using the chat in ways that are inappropriate, uh, putting pictures up, sharing, all that kind of stuff. So, so you need to balance those kinds of things. So this brings the question to um, who do you want to attend your congregational meetings on Zoom? Is it just your members? Is it just, is it your members and friends or is it open to other people who might be interested in it? We'll be talking about how you can do registration for these meetings later, but the, um, it, some aspects of the meetings are easier if it's only your members because then you know everyone who is present can vote with, uh, with without having to, to worry about that. It's often easier for a quorum count. And yet you may have some active people in your congregation who are friends who want to be able to attend. And so you have to figure that out. Um, I would suggest that if you, you know, if you want to include friends, what you could do is ask them to indicate to you that they're interested in attending. And so you know that they're known to you and then you can send out the information about how to connect by the meal uh, to the meeting. How do you let people know how to get into the meeting? We recommend that you either email them directly the link 
or that you have your link behind a member's wall on your congregation's website, not someplace that is public and accessible to everyone. Zoom bombers uh, both go trolling for this, but also um, use bots uh, to be able to, to look for Zoom dot us links on websites and so they can come in so by having it now zoom has done some great work on security they're uh, making those the meeting numbers much more complex they also now are making as a default that you need a password those of you who came into this meeting by clicking on the link the password was embedded in that link so if you're saying huh I didn't have to enter a password, that's why. But if you entered with just the join me, you had to enter both the um, both the, the number of the meeting and also the password. So you wanna make sure that you're not just giving that out to anyone. You also need to pay attention to what global settings you want on your Zoom account. These are done in your zoom.us account online. They're not done through the desktop app that you may have downloaded. You uh, want to make sure that no one can enter before the host and you use a waiting room like we did today. I also recommend that unless you have a reason for people to be able to work on a document together, you do not allow annotations because that allows somebody then to be able to write all over your screen. There's also a number of other settings um, and we can go into more of those later, but I wanna talk, uh, there's lots of information you can find about that in the, in the Zoom support web, or web portal. So I'm not gonna go into that now unless we have time later in the meeting. I'm showing the slides from another computer than the one I'm where I have my camera. And so I keep on hitting the advanced slide button on the wrong computer. So if you look at me going, that's what's happening. So one of the things is to figure out what kind of Zoom gathering do you want? Zoom has two possibilities, a meeting or a webinar. Now, most of the accounts that I know people have do not have that webinar format. The, uh, the account that you can get through the UUA generally does not have that, but some of you may have bought an account that allows you to, uh, to do the webinar. So the meeting form, it allows people a chance to see each other, like when we just began before I started sharing the screen, you could see other people's pictures. And that can be really good when you've been, um, when you've been isolated. There's also ways that you can pin the video and spotlight it so that particular people's pictures are primary. Um, those settings, of course, can be changed by viewers, but that's part of it. You can use, allow people to raise hands and you can use Zoom polls. In the webinar form, it's very different because there really is just one picture that's up and that's of the presenter or of the, um, of the uh, panelists if you have a panel, but it does not allow you to see everyone. Um, people still can raise hands, they can be unmuted by the presenters, and they can vote on Zoom polls. But part of it is really um, how large is your gathering and whether or not you want people to be actually be able to see each other's faces. And as I said, for many of us, we don't really have much of an option. I know mine only allows the meeting form and not the webinar form. So here's a little bit more on Zoom settings. Um, in the global settings, you need to make sure that you have enabled polling, that you have enabled screen sharing, but you probably want to restrict that um, uh, once you get into the meeting by the meeting controls to make sure it's only the host who can do that, or you might, you can also allow particular individuals to do that, co-hosts can as well. You want to enable the waiting room so people can go there and you can make sure that they're allowed. You want to make sure on those global settings that you have a, um, given permission for co-hosts to be appointed. If you're going to use breakout rooms for small discussion around things, you want to also have that enabled. If you're planning on using a third party site like uh, broadcasting your Zoom meeting through Facebook Live or something else, you wanna make sure that you've allowed the live streaming on that global setting. If you're gonna use a whiteboard, again, you have to enable that. And you may want to consider um, using allowing remote control, which would give me permission, uh, you know, the host permission to give somebody else the chance to advance slides. So if you're having, for example, a presentation by your nominating committee, they could be sharing the slides or advancing the slides to go along with their um, 
<clears throat> with their conversation rather than you trying to guess when they need the next slide. So now let's talk about some of the legalities and how you actually do this. Well, are there any questions so far? I, I'll just stop and see. I don't see anything that's come up. Oh, there's um, Sherry. Okay. Um, Sherry asks, we will live stream our annual meeting with an unlisted live stream to the non-members. That's a great one. You can also pin and spotlight video on a webinar. Thank you. Good to know this. Since I don't have that access, I can't do that. But you can in a meeting. And, and this is the meeting form that we're using right now. So on as as part of all of this, one of the um, one of the resources that's available on the UUA website, and if you go to uua.org, you'll see in the upper left hand corner there is a link for all COVID related materials. Um, you can just click on that, and then you can scroll through lists of there's over 130 different resources that have been developed just to help congregations during this time. This is the actual link to the one on um, the on how you can legally hold a congregational meeting. Again, I will be sending out the slides and, and this resource is listed there, but if you can't wait until that point, you can just go and search for um, uh, legal congregational meetings and this should pop up. So in conjunction, in consultation with one of the UUA's lawyers, one of the things that they said, or they said a number of things. And the first one is that you do need to give proper notice as is in your bylaws. The, the COVID um, disaster pandemic does not really allow you to shortchange that notice period or that method of notice. So you might have to, uh, you know, if it's two weeks ahead or whatever, you'll have to send those notices all out. Your bylaws may specify that it has to be done by postal mail. If it just is by mailing, you could probably get away with emailing as well. Um, it is great to point out in that a call to the meeting that um, that you are doing a virtual meeting because of the need for physical distancing doing to the pan due to the pandemic and that because of this you're going to alter the way that you ordinarily do things you also want to draft your rules of procedure that allow and have in them that you're specifically going to allow electronic or virtual voting. And then as you're one of the first things that you do, you want to ask your, your meeting attendees to vote that they are in agreement with that. So that notice needs to go out just as it always does. One of the things to consider, and I talked about this a bit before, is whether or not the meeting is open to other people. And a lot of this depends on the level of trust in your congregation. If your congregation is in a cranky period where they don't trust leadership, you're going to have to follow protocol that is much more strict and rigid than if you are, um, if you have a good sense of trust in the congregation. So again, this first question is who is invited? Is it just the friends or is it members and others? Um, you also have to um, be much more strict about your voting options if there is a lack of trust. Do you need to control who has access to vote? Do you need an audit trail that is there? Um, and um, and so that, you know, those are the, the uh, some of the things around that voting, just to make sure. So if, you know, in our regional assembly, we realized that we only had about three and a half or four weeks to turn the meeting from in person to uh, to a virtual meeting that included all the programming and all of this. And we did not have the ability to get in touch with our 200 congregations to find out who are your delegates and to provide them with separate email information about doing an external poll. So we decided to go with the trust. And as I talked about earlier, we only had about 95 people of the 200, over 200, maybe 240 or 50 who were present during the business meeting who actually cast ballots. And so we figured that people were really paying attention to that, but we could count on the trust and we expected that and talked about that at the beginning. 
If your congregation is in a tougher place, or if you have people who are sticklers for the um, for following the bylaws, and ordinarily I am, but in uh, in times of disaster, I'm not so much. You may need to be very cautious and careful about that. And again, as I said before, nothing controversial uh, that can't be delayed should be considered. We just simply don't have enough information in looking at each other. We can't see everyone if it's a congregation of more than you know 30 people who are on the meeting. And so we can miss a lot of things and just create a lot of heartache. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. One of them is, in what circumstances would you want co-hosts? Um, you always want at least one other co-host because, for example, right now, if some of you were to start misbehaving, I wouldn't be able to handle that by myself while still trying to carry on the webinar. You also just want to make sure that if you're having, a, I'll be talking about this in a a bit. If you're having a whole bunch of people who are coming in, you need somebody helping you get people in through the waiting room. Um, and so I'll talk more about that later. But it's just also good to have a backup. We try, we learned partway through that we really needed more redundancy than we had about where the slides were available and who could show them because my computer was acting up. And so partway through the meeting, I had to haul out my other computer and transfer it over on a thumb drive and I should have done all that before. This is a note to yourself. You want that redundancy and you want somebody else to be able to grab it from, uh, grab that slide deck if you're using one so they can share it in case your power goes out or anything like that or you lose your, your internet connection. Um, somebody's saying we're exploring vote by mail and adopting a ballot uh, such that changes during a meeting can be noted on the ballot. So no virtual voting, all mail in and after the meeting. That's one way to do it. If there are issues that can wait for that, that's great. You then have to figure out, okay, where are those ballots going? How do we get access to them? If your building is closed, what does that mean? But that's a great other solution. <clears throat> and again, you know, I don't have all the answers. I'm just telling you what I've figured out. So, but, so I love these comments. Um, and then uh, someone has posted, there's a great description of the host and co-host or alternative host in Zoom support. There's a lot of stuff in Zoom support. I highly recommend you go to zoom.us and click on their support. They're, they have some of the best tutorials that I have seen in the technological world on how to do things. So one of the features that Zoom has is that you can have people register for the meeting through Zoom. I'm not going to tell you how you go about this because they are the great webinars uh, or, you know, a support thing. But what it does is you can send people a link with how they register for the meeting. Just like you all had to register for this, but it's actually through Zoom and it allow it um, lets you know in advance who's coming to the meeting. It gives you their contact information. You can ask specific questions of them. There's standard questions that you can opt for, but then there's also extra ones. Like, is, are you, uh, how many people in your household will be watching who are legal voting members? So that you know whether this household has two or three or, you know, are 15 members staying there. Um, one congregation I was talking to earlier this week allows proxy voting. So you could ask them, do you have anyone's proxy? Um, and so this also, by having that list, you can then check to make sure that it is all people who are legally allowed to vote in your congregation. Um, and it would uh, be able to let you predetermine whether or not you have quorum. So if you look at that list and you have 25 people registered, if your quorum's 30, you know you need to go get some more people registered. Um, you know, so you can figure out that kind of thing before the meeting. And then what will happen is as they come into the meeting, um, if they are on that registration list, even if, you know, once you open the meeting, um, it makes it much easier in the waiting room. I believe they will, if they're already registered and, oh, when when they're registering, they can either be automatically approved or you can manually approve them. And um, I would recommend the manually approving because it gives you a, that little bit more control. But then anybody who signs in with that same registration email that they use to register, they'll be um, directly admitted into the room. Uh, it creates the specific link in that. And oh, and I, yeah, the 
manual. And um, and then the the meeting information is sent to them automatically, so you don't have to send out a separate email with that. I found that was a really good feature um, to, to be able to figure that out. So when you're actually in the Zoom room, um, there are some control options you want to do. And if you are the host, you have access to these options through the toolbar that's often at the bottom on a computer. It may be at the top on some. And so the, once the, the host will start the meeting, there are some things that the host only can do that other people cannot do. And before they admit anybody else, they set various things. So they go into the chat menu and they determine, am I going to let people um, chat to everyone? Am I going to have them chat only to the host? Um, and I have I have permanently disabled, or you know, in the global settings, the one-to-one -one chat, which means that you can't pass notes um, back and forth in class. Um, and again, this depends on how, the trust and how open the meeting is. Um, and uh, and you can set and change the limits during the meeting as well. The host or co-host can do that. You can also, as a host or co-host, determine whether or not you're going to allow people to unmute themselves, unname themselves, and all of those kinds of things. And so those controls are in the bottom of the screen. So as far as whether or not they can talk, you know, how do you want to allow discussion? Is it like I'm doing today where I'm asking you to put them in the chat and I will respond to them? Or is it that you want people to be able to unmute themselves or perhaps raise their hand and then unmute themselves? Or do you, you could unmute them as well. Uh, you also will have an option about how you set the share screen feature. I recommend that it only be the host or the co-host can share rather than the um, rather than anybody in the congregation, uh, anybody in the meeting, because that's one of the ways that if a Zoom bomber gets in, they can try to grab the share screen and put yucky stuff up on that. All right. So then we're to the waiting room. All this stuff really has been just getting you ready to have the meeting. So now it's the time of the meeting. You have the waiting room check-in. Again, this allows you to make sure that only those people you want in the meeting are in the meeting. This can take longer than you expect. When we had, uh, when we were doing regional assembly, we had you know, at, at various times, but I think the max we had at one time was about 250. We had four or five people checking people in uh, because that was a lot of people. If you're in a congregation that has several hundred who are coming to your meeting, that's going to take a while. So this is one of those times when you would want co-hosts who could do that because the only people who can approve are either the host or the co-host. And so it takes, if you're checking a list, it can take up to 30 seconds to find a person on the list especially if they sign in with a different screen name than you uh, than they registered with. And so I just, you know, uh, suggest that you can divide the alphabet up so that, you know, uh, Joan would take letters A through C and Linda would take D through G and, and Lynn would take, you know, and that kind of thing so that you can make sure that you're, you're not um, all looking at the same person at the same time. And that you make sure that you have your list in alphabetical order by first name, because that's what's most likely going to pop up. So then you also have to have this discussion about what do you do with less than complete names. Now, in your congregations, you probably know many of the people you expect to be there, and that can be uh, possible. You can admit them and track them into the meeting to make sure that you know who they are. One of the things that's a bit crazy is that the host and co-host can message people who are in the waiting room, but the people in the waiting room cannot talk back. Um, so um, you might uh, want to send a message into the waiting meeting room to have people, if you don't know who they are, text or email someone whose job it is to look out for that and track that so they can be admitted in. All right, the quorum count. Now the meeting has begun um, or almost begun because there's a couple of things that happened before this book. One of the things about the quorum count um, is how do you do that? You know, one way was if you pre-register people and then you can count that. Another one is there's a raising hands function that is in Zoom. <clears throat> I'm going to have you all practice doing this um, and uh, just so that you know how to tell other people. So if you go to on the bottom of your screen or, you know, where your controls are, you will see the participants menu. 
and you want to click on that. And then at the bottom, I'm going to stop sharing now so we can see this a little bit clearer as it happens. Um, at the bottom of that participants menu, you should have an invitation to raise your hands. Look at all those blue hands popping up all over the place. And so you could say, you know, okay, um, you know, please raise your hand so we can count for quorum. So you can sit there and count the pictures on the screen, or also you'll notice in that participant panel, the people's hands are there. So you can just scroll down that list and look at it and do that. And then as the host, I can lower all the hands. It's very easy. Now, if you're doing it this way, though, you have to have a second round in case there's two voting members at the same computer or three, so you can count those people and add them back in. Um, so I'm now coming back to share the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, a, another way that you can uh, do this is that you can, um, do the Zoom polls. I'm going to be going more to the polls and show you how you do those in a while. Um, one of the, the issues, though, is that host and co-hosts are not allowed to vote on polls in Zoom. So um, there's a couple of ways around that. One is that they simply give up their votes. Another one is that you could un, you could remove the host, could remove the co-hosts during the votes and then restore that co-host procedure afterwards. Um, but that can be a, a problem. Um, uh, Sherry's asking if there you have over 100 participants, is it hard to count the hands up? Absolutely it is, uh, you know, because it, it's difficult. That might work best with smaller congregations. Um, and, um, and then the other is the pre-registration list. If you had people pre-register, if you had quorum, you just got to make sure that most of those people are in the meeting so that you can do that. You can also use outside polling software, and I will be talking about that as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yes, yeah, someone is saying when the participants and the chat are both open, the raise hand is at the bottom of the participants section. Yes, um, that's true. It might not be at the bottom of the screen, it's at the bottom of that section. So that's a good thing to note. <clears throat> you could use the chat room and I have the host count votes. Again, that's going to work if you have a small number of people. But if you have, um, you know, 75 or 80 people at your meeting, counting all those yes votes can be problematic because it's so easy. The way that the Zoom chat scrolls and the participant uh, list scrolls, uh, you, you know, as people add things, you might lose track of who has voted and who not unless you're checking them off on a list. That's why I, I would recommend some kind of uh, poll, um, either Zoom or outside polling program. Okay, um, come on, here we go. All right. At the beginning of the meeting, one of the things that the council again recommended was that you declare the intention of why you're having the virtual meeting. You state in this meeting, it's because of the way physical distancing is required by the government or recommended by the Center for Disease Control or your other public health officials. It might be that um, your state may have lifted the, um, the restrictions on gathering, and, but you don't have to follow this state's recommendations. You can rely on science to say, hey, we're gonna be really safe. Um, and, um, and so that's one way to do that. You need to say at the beginning, so you need to say we're having it this way because of the pandemic. You want to say that unusual times call for new ways to do business. And you also right at the beginning want to help explain to people how you will take votes and do an example so that people can learn the methodology. I will be showing you and having you do a poll in a bit of time. Um, you could, uh, someone said, could you, if you use the list to admit people, that could be a way that you could note quorum as well. Yes, if uh, if you're only admitting people who are, are voting members of your society, yes, that would be another way to do it. Again, there's multiple ways. These are just the ones that I've, I've thought of. All right. Um, Legal counsel also recommended that it's really important for you to make sure that people know that you could, that uh, they, that you know that people will know whether or not um, you can hear. And so again, you can do this by, um, <clears throat> by having a show of hands. You can do this by, um, 
by having a polling question. Um, you can um, you can have uh, if you have a small enough group, you can have people unmute themselves and say here, 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 and do that kind of thing. And that could also help with quorum. But you want to make sure you you can't have a meeting where people can't hear what's going on and be expected to vote. So uh, you can do that. And so you need to keep track of the yes and no responses and try to see if you can problem solve with people um, that they can't hear. Often what can happen is that people will, um, uh, their internet connection might be bad. So you can suggest that they join on the phone or other ways. But this is a way to make sure that you are following best advice and protocol. The other part of this advice is that you need to reaffirm the votes taken in a virtual meeting at your next in-person congregational meeting. This doesn't mean you have to open up the questions again to say, okay, how do you, you know, how do you, uh, how, how do we want to decide this now? But instead, it's being able to say, this is what, you know, these are the votes that we took. Do you reaffirm that these votes were taken and that the results were that these things passed? Um, it's not about re-debating all of that kind of thing. And so you, you uh, do that. Um, you know, to make sure that you will, you let people know that. And then you also have to remember to do that at your next in-person congregational meeting, because that will then show that you have done your best due diligence to cope with unusual circumstances where you weren't allowed to come together. You also might want to consider once this is over, how do you amend your bylaws that might make this thing not so difficult legally uh, if, if there's another spike or if there's some other issues such as, you know, if you're, if you're building flooded and you couldn't get in it for the meeting, you could then uh, go to something like this to do that. All right, so again, we talked a bit about this, you know, the discussion side, how are you going to have discussion on matters? Are you going to uh, have the host unmute people, you know, maybe have them raise their hand if they have a question? Are you going to allow your members to unmute and have that? Or are you going to use the chat? Um, and you can then decide if you're having conversation or discussion by chat, whether or not people chat to everyone or chat only to the host. But you want to ensure the maximum amount of, of flexibility and access you can, given your numbers and the degree of trust. You don't want people to later say, huh, you know, uh, they railroaded X through, especially if it's controversial. But you want to make sure that you have ways that people feel that they can truly participate in your meeting. Okay, now we're getting to the polling options. How do you actually take votes? Um, Again, depends on the level of trust. If there is a high level of trust, you might be, you don't necessarily need to have the same degree of tracking to know who voted um, and whether or not it was only members that voted. But if you do, then you, uh, if you do need to have that locked down, then you can make sure that you can uh, get, send polling information to only to those people who are legal voting members. <clears throat> and if you're using Zoom polls, you can't, you don't have that uh, flexibility, but there are other options outside of that. So you can use the chat to vote yes or no um, on, on a matter. Um, you can also use other uh, forms, SurveyMonkey polling software. So now I'm gonna go over these a little bit more. Zoom polling, one of the, one of the things that happens from a lot of different uh, platforms is that you can only have one vote per device that's connected. So if you're going to uh, do Zoom polling, there is a workaround that I discovered that I think uh, works easily and well. One of the things too, but you have to think these through and sort this out beforehand. So one of the things with Zoom is you can, uh, you can type in your polls before the meeting. You, there's a couple of different ways. One is you can go and you can edit the meeting and add polls. Another is that they um, can be added during the meeting as well, or, or you, could, you could start the meeting. One of the things with Zoom is it doesn't really care when you have your meeting. So you could start the meeting on a Wednesday and put all your polls in there and then and save them and close it up. And then you, know, you could come, then start it again on Sunday and Zoom won't care and they don't mind. Um, 
one of the things is it's only the key host, the person who set up the meeting, you know, who's logged in with the meeting ID uh, information, who can create the posts or the, the polls. Co-host can launch them and share them, but it's only the meeting host who can actually create them. And so that person also has to be available to create them during the meeting. Uh, one of the things that, you know, because there's only one poll or one person, you know, device can only vote once on a matter, I have figured out a way to get around that. So right now I'm going to launch a poll. And you should see how uh, we have figured out to do this. And you may need to scroll a bit on yours because it's a little long. Um, I've asked your ice cream choice. Now you'll notice this is a biased poll, and I invite you all to, to vote on this. Um, so uh, you should be able to do that just by clicking your answer. You'll notice it's a little biased. They're all flavors of chocolate, um, but you know, I got to do the poll. So what the first one is for the first person on the device, you would vote what your favorite ice cream is. You cannot, however, submit a poll or, but you know, sorry, let me rephrase that. In order to have a second person who may be viewing the screen, I added the second person one where people can, you could vote twice if you wanted. You, you know, if you were in Chicago, that's, you know, vote early and vote often is their motto. But if there's no second person, you have that option of clicking no second person. And it's the same with the third person where you can um, click on no third person. So you would have people, um, you allow this up. I can see that 42% of you have voted so far. And so people do this. You do have to have all three. And then you hit the submit button when you're done. I'm going to give you only about half of you have done it. I'm giving you some more time. On iPads, you're going to have to find out where this is differently. Um, you, you know, in your team, you might want to have somebody who's on the meetings in iPads or, or other tablets to help figure out. This can be difficult for people who are only on the phone. We're going to be talking about uh, differences like that in a bit of time as well. Okay, um, so uh, we're about 90. I'm going to give you like five more seconds. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to end the polling. And then what I can do is I can share the results with you. So now you are seeing that, you know, in the from the first person, um, you know, tw uh, Chocolate and uh, chocolate almond was the biggest one there. On my screen, I'm not sure if it's on your screen, but on my screen, I can see the absolute numbers. So what I would do before sharing this is I would take how many people, it's seven who chose just chocolate on person one. Second person, I would add the one person there who showed just chocolate. And then I would go down and I would add the third person. Nobody showed chose chocolate. So I would know there were eight votes. And I would announce the number of votes for each of these options. Um, I would not announce the number of votes for the no second person or no third person. But this then allows people to see what's happening. <clears throat> and it's a good way for you to be able to have more than one vote or to represent more than one voter. Or if somebody has a proxy vote, they can do it that way. I'm going to stop sharing the results. If those are still up on your computer, you can um, <clears throat> just click the, the X or the red dot in the corner and the poll will actually disappear so that you don't need to, uh, you're not looking at it the whole time. <clears throat> um, so that's one to, um, is the account, uh, Tracy asks, is the accountability recorded also? If you have people Zoom register for the meeting, then yes, you have the vote trail to know who, who from that has has voted? I don't believe you have an idea of who act how they voted, but you actually do have a sense of that they voted. But there is not that kind of audit trail in the Zoom voting. So ways around that is to have it only be members who are in the in the room, so that you know that no one who should not have voted um, does that. You have to, uh, you know, you have to trust people that they didn't vote two or three times if they're if they're the only one in their home. Um, uh, <clears throat> and again, there's lots of information on this, uh, you know, how to how to do a poll. They don't have the multiple screen thing. That was something that that I had to figure out and play with after I had a couple fails on it. Um, so then another one is you could use forms. Um, so this 
all these other options require access to a browser while you're in the meeting. So people would not only have to have their Zoom meeting up, they would also have to be able to access a browser. Um, <clears throat> so you can use things like Google Forms um, or this. And, and one of the questions with any kind of polling other than the Zoom polling is you have to decide when do we allow people to vote? Do we share that link during the meeting? Um, you could put it in the chat and people could uh, click on it and get there, or you could send an email out to people at the beginning of the meeting that says, here's where you access, uh, access the, the voting. You would send it, of course, only to the voting members of your congregation. <clears throat> the Google uh, forms are free to anybody with a Google account or has a Gmail address or whatever thing like that. You can also set up forms in Wufu and I, I uh, Wufu or there's other programs. These are the two I know the best. Um, and again, they have good uh, information about how do you set up a form. You just send a link and it will populate a spreadsheet with the answers so that you can then look at that. You can then get that result and use the screen sharing like I am with the PowerPoint to show people the results of the vote. That would also give you a sense of an ability to be able to, um, to, uh, to, uh, I don't know what that sentence started off at. Um, we'll ignore that and go on. But it does give you a sense of, of who can, who has voted. Another one is using an external polling software. Um, again, this requires access to a browser doing the meeting and the question about when do you send in the link. Um, Oh, someone says, if forms are used, could you extend voting? Um, yes, you could. You can decide how long to keep those up. Um, <clears throat> and um, and I'll, I'll talk about that just in a moment, too, about one of these. You could use SurveyMonkey, which will allow you to create uh, uh, polls or you know surveys that you have as polls where you can do that. There are ways that you can make sure that, um, that that allows more than one response from the same computer. That's a setting that you can serve in there. So that would be a way that you could do that. And it would track the votes back to, um, you would have to decide whether or not you wanted people's names attached to it, but it would at least track it back to an IP address. Poll Everywhere is another poll. You can uh, do a poll with up to 25 people for free. So if you're a smaller group, that can, or up to 700 is $120 for a year for one user. So um, only one person can technically do the polls and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> it is not ethical to share that login information, but you can do what you want. Simply Voting is another software and um, the cost is determined by how many voters you have. And you have to say, I have, 49 voters and they'll tell you what the cost, cost will be. Election Buddy allows you for up to 20 people for free, um, up to 350 voters for $19 an election. And this does allow voting over a period of time. One of our congregations is doing their, uh, their vote on their ministerial candidate this way. So they're having the polling up for three or four days where people can go in and vote. One concern I have about that is that if information comes up later in the process or through the discussion in the meeting, um, if you have it up later, you know, that kind of thing. It also, um, I liked that suggestion of sending uh, the, the poll out after there have been any motions to change the motion because anything that you do um, that uh, is not, that allows voting before the actual meeting, if there are any amendments to the, to the motion, you have to figure out whether or not to accept the votes that came in before that. And again, in all of these, you can share the results by sharing screen. And you can look at, um, you know, check out these different kinds of software. And there's, there's more than these. These are just the ones that I know of uh, that I've either used or people I know have used. So, several issues that come up across all of this. One is how do you involve people who don't have internet or smart devices? How do you allow them to be part of the meeting? How do you 
take their votes. Um, if you have people who have a landline, you could have somebody conference them in on a phone and be able, so if I could, um, you know, if I'm dialing into the Zoom with my phone, I can then add a caller. And so the other person, if they call me or I call them, they can hear the audio as well. And then you would just have to have a, a system set up where those, the, the known people who don't have device um, are able to do voice voice votes and those are you know my solution would be is that uh, you know if if my uncle George um, was only on a landline then I would I as the person designated to be linked up with George would then text the result of George's vote to the person who's compiling all the votes or something like that. You can also have mail-in ballots for questions that you know will not be changing. Um, you know, if there's no possibility of, say, nominating additional people from the floor for positions, people could send in uh, a mail-in ballot. You then, of course, have to take care and look at the whole thing about um, about social distancing. You, um, there's the issue of the co-host and host, whether or not they can vote. You could simply un host them or remove their co-hosting. How do you deal with proxy voting? I mentioned that earlier, absentee voting. Um, the good news is if it's a virtual meeting, most people should be able to access it from anywhere. Chromebook used to be a real problem on Zoom, but just as of April 14th, Zoom now supports the Chromebook um, operating system. And so you would get people who would be able to then uh, connect with that um, if they can go to zoom.us and get that information. Phew, this has been a marathon. Um, are, there, um, are there other things, uh, questions that you have? So many churches may have, um, may have polling as part of their database packages. So yes, check with your office manager. Some of the church database programs really do allow this in there. Um, just as you're typing your questions, I'm just gonna show you the next few slides just to let you know um, this, these will be coming out to you later today with the resources on legality, the technical questions. Um, uh, this is slightly old about how to do voting because that was as of March 30th. Uh, a lot has happened in a month and um, some of what I'm saying isn't included there. Zoom US for their support. LinkedIn Learning, which was formerly lynda.com, has tutorials on how to do forms and other software. And that's the end of the slideshow. So that will that stuff will be going out to you. So um, um, you mentioned ROPs. Do we need to address a virtual meeting? RO, oh, the rules of procedure. Took me a moment to figure that out. I would think that your rules, you would say yes. You know, how are people going to share? How are they going to, you know, um, how, you know, do people, if there's, if you're allowing speaking, you know, do you have time limits on that? And I would, and then that um, I would think that you would try to have some information in that about how you're voting and how the votes will be considered and that people understand why I would include people understanding why you're having the virtual meeting and that they agree that these will be ratified and uh, are reaffirmed during the next meeting. Any other questions? I, I know I've been speaking at a rapid fire pace, but I, um, you know, I want you to make sure that you can um, reach out to me with questions about this, especially after I send out the slides, because uh, before then, you, uh, you know, many of those answers could be there. My email address is lpresley at uua.org. And if you forget how I spell Presley, just Google Elvis. We have the same spelling. Um, and so I want to thank you. I want to wish you luck in your meetings. And I look forward to seeing you at another webinar some other time.